right. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome to um, a, uh, another Hot Politics meeting. Uh, today, um, I'm very happy to uh, introduce you Manos Tsakiris, uh, somebody who has been on our radar for, uh, for a while now, uh, a professor of psychology at Royal Holloway, and um, is, uh, has a, a, a very wide range of research topics, uh, many of which uh, Gijs and I know absolutely nothing. Um, but uh, um, also doing work uh, is very become very interested in recent years in uh, the role of uh, of images and the connection to politics. And some of his work has been really inspiring for us to think about the power of images. And uh, we're very happy to have Manos here today. Uh, he will talk for 20, 25 minutes, as you are familiar with. Um, Afterwards, there's time for Q&A. You can ask these questions in the uh, Q&A box and then Gijs will read them out loud and uh, Manos will answer. So uh, without further ado, Manos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bert and, uh, and guys for the, for the kind invitation. I've been following your work too and uh, it's great that uh, we, you know, we get to do this uh, seminar. So assuming that you can actually see my slides because there's always this doubt when one presents via Zoom, uh, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about the research we've been doing as part of a project that um, we have been developing over the last four years about visual politics. And this is a project that I developed not at my main lab, but I'm doing it at the Warburg Institute, which is an institute that studies the history of culture and uh, it is especially interested in the history of images. So at the Warburg Institute, we have been developing the BIAS project, which, start, which stands for Body and Image in Art and Science. And one of the key questions that we wanted to ask is, how do we bodily relate and respond to other people in a culture that it is powered by images? And if you like, that was the overarching question. And I've tried to answer this question with this amazing group of, of people who have been working uh, with me over the last four years. Now, images, in the many different forms, uh, from icons to paintings to photography and beyond, have always been very powerful uh, cultural agents, shaping uh, our culture and our understanding of sociopolitical events. And this power of image has been discussed in many different disciplines, from art history to anthropology to philosophy, photojournalism, and more recently to visual global uh, politics. Now, images, uh, especially iconic images that have a lot of uh, political capacity. And these are just some examples of images that you have seen, uh, perhaps uh, in many different media outlets. And these kind of images have shaped our understanding of the world. Um, this is an image showcasing the, the tortures in Iraqi prisons. You know, there were articles written in, in US media for about a year, and nobody was really believing the stories that were coming out of Iraq. But when the image appeared, everybody was convinced that these torches were actually happening. This is another infamous image uh, taken in September 2015 at the shores of a beach in Turkey. And it is an iconic image of the refugee crisis. It shifted EU policy. It resulted in a huge increase in donations to charities um, and changed a little bit our understanding of the refugee crisis and um, what was going on in the Mediterranean. Um, this is another image that uh, became iconic two summers ago uh, during the, the crisis at the Mexican-US borders and the detention of children apart from their parents. And it highlighted uh, in the Times Magazine. Now, as part of the BIAS project, we wanted to ask, you know, what kind of responses this kind of image elicit to people and why for some people, you don't seem to be getting this kind of responses. So here you can see the infamous journalist Katie Hopkins uh, from The Sun, who says, you know, I really don't care. You know, you can show me this kind of images, but I don't, I don't care at all. So with this kind of insights, uh, we developed a psychophysiology lab housed at the Warburg Institute. And we tried to bring uh, together insights from different disciplines. And when we set up our lab, we were very excited because we thought that we would be following the work or the vision of Abi Warburg, who was one of the first people who thought really um, an interesting, innovative 
ways about interdisciplinary research. So that was November 2016, and soon after we, uh, we set up our lab, this is what happened. Trump was inaugurated as president of the United States, and on the same day, this is what happened. We started thinking about alternative facts. And this is a good example because the whole idea, the whole concept of alternative facts emerged out of our understanding of these different images where you can see the Obama inauguration, the Trump inauguration, and the question is, you know, which of the two crowds is bigger? And it was on that day, I think, that the very term alternative facts was introduced in, uh, in, in, our, in our everyday jargon. And soon after that, the Time magazine was wondering whether truth is dead. So the kind of question we wanted to ask in our project about, you know, how do we respond to this kind of images became slightly different. And here you can see an image, and I guess most of you would think that what you're actually seeing is probably um, a refugee child, um, maybe sleeping next to his parents' graves. And that, that would make sense as, as a narrative of what the image is all about. But then you can start thinking, maybe, you know, this is not a real image. Maybe it is an image that has been staged. Maybe it serves some kind of political propaganda. So, we're finding ourselves in this kind of strange um, info system, if you like, and info wars about the veracity of the material that we're actually consuming. And as many of you did, you know, during the first few months of 2017, we all went back and we started reading Hannah Arendt again and other important thinkers. And Hannah Arendt said that, you know, the ideal subject of uh, totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and that is the reality of experience, and the distinction between true and false, in other words, the standards of thought, no longer exist. And I think this, this quote by Arendt frames well what we set out to do, thinking a little bit about you know, the reality of your experience, of your engagement with the world, as an index for distinguishing between fact and fiction. Now, trying to apply that to, to images, the history of images, um, the topic of authenticity of images has a very long history. Here you can see what is arguably one of the most famous war images of all times, the falling soldier by Kappa. And even for that image, you know, we're still debating whether it was a real image taken by Kappa as the soldier was falling or whether it was a staged image. Um, and you can see other examples here of images that have been manipulated or altered. And of course, if we think, okay, how can we distinguish between real and fake images, images that have been manipulated? How can we do that? You know, here you have um, two images that are real, genuine, and one image that has been manipulated. And I'm not gonna tell you the answer, uh, but we can talk about it later if you want. And how do, how do we solve this problem? You know, there may be some ways in which you can think about the effects of framing, where you see these images may matter. So depending on your, on your political orientation, whether you see this in media outlets that you trust, you may be more likely to believe that this image is genuine and real. If you see it in a, in a website that you don't trust or belongs to uh, you know, an opposing political ideology, you may be less likely to, to trust it. Expertise matters if you're a photojournalist or if you work with digital material, you may be able to actually very fast depict what has been happening in this image and which of these is manipulated. And of course, we have photo forensics. So nowadays, you can computationally um, assess whether an image has been manipulated. But for the, for the purpose, and one more thing is, you know, um, contextual effects are important. This is a study that it uh, was developed by Ulrich Kirk and David Friedberg, and they took IAPS pictures, they took two groups of participants, and they instructed one group that they're gonna show them pictures taken from a documentary uh, depicting real life events, and the other group got the instruction they will see images that uh, were taken from art exhibitions. And you can put people in the scanner and you can see which brain areas are activated um, when people are looking at these images, and you can find very clear contextual framing um, effect, sorry. Uh, so you can see that people who believe that these images are taken from a documentary, you will find increased responses in limbic areas that are involved in the processing of emotions. But for the purpose of the bias project, what we were interested in was what is the immediate, if you like, um, experience that we all have when we wake up in the morning, we open our Twitter feed or our Facebook or our 
uh, favorite newspaper or media website, and we look at these kind of images that come from across the world. What is the kind of bodily response that you have when you look at this image, and how this may actually influence the kind of judgments you make about the realness, authenticity, veracity, trustworthiness of the image? So we started tentatively with some online experiments. We selected uh, a set of 80 photojournalistic images that to the best of our knowledge have not been staged or manipulated. Of course, every image is um, a selective presentation of the world. You know, the photographer is aiming his or her lens to a particular scene and takes a picture with specific aesthetics in mind. But to the best of our knowledge, these images were not um, staged. And most of these images, as you can see, they do have um, a quite um, negative balance. So we started with an online experiment, and that's very important because I want you to understand the structure of the experiment. People sign up for the experiment, and the only information that they get when they sign up and they read the informed consent is the following. We tell them we're going to show you a series of photos and ask you to rate each one in terms of the arousal. In other words, how intense is the feeling that this photo triggers in you? So they will see each photo for four seconds, and then they have to tell us how arousing was the image from low to high, how intense was the feeling that they experienced. And they will do that for all 80 pictures. And then at the end, they think that the experiment is over, but we tell them, Hold on a second, the experiment is not over. Would you like to take part now in the second part of our experiment? And if they say yes, they will proceed to the second part of the experiment, where we inform them that now we're gonna show you again the same pictures, and we want you to judge whether the picture is real or fake. And we define what we mean by a real picture, a picture that was taken during a real life event. In other words, it captures the event as it happened, when it happened, the event was not staged, and the emotions, if any, depicted are genuine. Whereas a fake image is an image that has, that maybe shows a staged event or is manipulated in a way that changes the nature or the content of the event. So again, they will see the same pictures in a new randomized order, four seconds each picture, and then they have to tell us whether they think that the image is real or fake and how confident they are in their judgment. So remember, when people sign up for the experiment, the only thing they know is that they have to make these judgments about the intensity of their feelings. And only later, they get the second bit of information that they have to judge the realness of the image. So what I'm plotting now here is each individual photograph. We had 80 photographs and the arousal levels that these photographs elicited. I'm gonna replace the bars with um, these dots. And you can see here, this is the average arousal rating for each picture. So I'm ordering them here in terms of increasing arousal. What is interesting, you can appreciate the variance. You can see that for every single picture, there were participants who didn't find the picture arousing at all, and another participant who may have found that image very arousing. Now, what we did next is that we looked at people's real and fake judgments in the second part of the experiment, and we compute a probability score of an image being judged as real. So this is a combination of people's judgment whether they said that the image is real or fake, and the confidence in the judgments. And everything above 50 here suggests that this particular image was more, was more likely to be judged as real. And you can appreciate that by and large, there seems to be this default to truth, that people tend to judge images, the images we show them, as more likely to be real than fake. But of course, the interesting question for us was whether there was some kind of relationship between the, the arousal that people reported in the first part of the experiment and the probability scores they gave in the second part of the experiment. And indeed, what we found was that the arousal that they reported was predictive of the probability of judging an image as being real. So as you can see, arousal is a significant predictor suggesting that the more arousal people experience for an individual photo in part one, the more likely and confident they are to judge this photo as real in part two. Another interesting finding that we saw across three different online experiments that we did is that this relationship between arousal and probability was stronger for older participants. Uh, in other words, the older the participants, the more they were guided by this uh, arousal 
that experience the first part of the experiment to inform the judgments about the realness of the images. Now, this may suggest an interesting distinction here between how digital native people and digital immigrants are actually engaging with this photography of, uh, of suffering. But that's something that we want to explore furthermore. Now, having done the online experiments that rely on subjective reports, we wanted to do a, a, physio a psychophysiology experiment in the lab. So we looked at how people's physiology engages when they first look at these images and whether this physiological engagement can again predict the judgments they will make about the realness of the images. So here's the structure of the experiment. People come in the lab. Again, the only information they will get when the sign up is the following. We're gonna show you images. We just want you to look at them and we're gonna record your heart rate and your skin conductance. And you're gonna do that for the eight images that we're gonna show you. And they do that, and at the end, they think that the experiment is over. That would tell them, no, it's not over. Now we want you to take part in the second part of the experiment, where we're going to show you the same image again, and we want you to tell us whether you think the image is real or fake. And again, what we found was in line with the first online studies, the physiological engagement is predictive or correlates significantly with, uh, with people's judgments. So smaller heart accelerations and larger heart accelerations were associated with increased probability of judging an image as being real. And this supports the view that, you know, there's an important contribution of the sympathetic system in shaping the subjective beliefs of uh, the photo realness that we asked them to do. Having looked at peripheral physiology, we thought, let's try to see if we can find uh, a signature of this kind of physiological engagement at the cortical level. So we looked at the heartbeat evoked potentials, that it is this cortical signature of afferent processing that is, that is being conveyed from the heart to the brain on every single heartbeat. So in a new experiment, in the first part, we asked participants to passively view these photos. We repeated each photo four times because we wanted to collect many heartbeats and therefore many heartbeat evoked potentials. They finished the first part of the experiment. They thought that the experiment was over. We told them, no, we want you to stay and do the second part. They did the second part, and then we're able to correlate the amplitude of the heartbeat evoked potential during the first part of the experiment with the judgments they made in the second part of the experiment. And what we found was that, again, at the level of this cortical signature of afferent processing, the heartbeat evoked potential, the amplitude of the signal could actually distinguish between images for which the participants gave a high probability of this image being real and a low probability of these images being real. Now, then we said, okay, maybe let's try to find an implicit measure because maybe it's quite explicit what we asked them to do, maybe it has different kinds of confounds or cognitive biases. So we designed an experiment where we tried to develop this implicit measure. And this is the structure of the experiment. In the first one, as we did in all the previous experiments, we asked people to judge, look at these images and tell us how intense is the feeling of the experience. And then they told them, we told them in the second part of the experiment that what we're gonna do now is we're gonna show you the same image again, and we're gonna tell you what fact-checking agencies have said about these images. Because these images are not all real and some images have been fact-checked to be real and some images have been fact-checked to be fake. And when we give you that information, we want you to tell us how surprised you are by this decision of the fact-checking agencies. In other words, you know, how surprising do you find the fact that this particular image was fact-checked as being real or fact-checked as being uh, fake? And the idea was to try and link this surprise measure with the arousal that they have reported in the first part of the experiment. And what we found here was that interesting interactions. So participants indicated greater surprise for the labeling of a picture when they had previously reported high arousal for that picture and that picture was subsequently labeled as fake. In other words, for us, that was an interesting implicit measure because it shows that the violation of the arousal that they had experienced the first part that should indicate realness, the violation of that by the fact-checking label of the image being fake elicited this greater surprise for our participants. 
Lastly, we try to do an analysis and look at the kind of emotions that people report when they're looking at these images and whether you know, the, um, the emotional signature for each image may be important in determining the kind of beliefs they form about the realness of the images. So we showed the participants each image and then we asked them to choose um, from, um, from a range of emotions and tell us how strongly they experience each emotion. And, you know, they could choose none of the emotions, they could choose two or more. And you can see here the list of the emotions that we told them. So for every image that they see, they can say, well, that image, you know, makes me feel a lot of compassion. It makes me feel a lot of um, disgust. Or they could say, you know, that image makes me feel afraid or guilty. And then in the second part of the experiment, again, we asked them to give us these realness judgments. So we can end up with some emotional signature for each image that we showed to the participants. And together with Raffaele Tucciarelli, we did uh, some interesting analysis to try and compute patterns of emotions associated to each image. Uh, then we did a principal component analysis to understand whether we can end up with specific clusters. And we ended up with two broad groups that we labeled violence and suffering. And these um, elicited very different types of emotions. And you can see here the emotion space. So there are images that we classify them as violence. And these images typically tended to elicit greater fear, disgust, and anger. And then there were images of suffering that tended to elicit greater tenderness, compassion, and sadness. And then we were able to actually see whether specific types of emotions may influence the subjective judgments that people make about the realness of the images. And what we found was that especially um, the anger compassion dimension and the guilt and hope dimension were the greatest predictors. So for images for which people experience more compassion, they were more likely to say that these images were real. And the same was true for images that elicit greater uh, feelings of, of hope. And lastly, we did an experiment that is very similar to the very first experiment I presented, where instead of asking people to tell us whether they think that the image is real or fake, we asked them to tell us whether they feel, whether they thought that the image was taken from an art um, or documentary. And the first part of the experiment was the same as before. People sign up, they only get information about the first part. We're gonna show you the images. We want you to tell us whether, uh, you know, how intense the feeling do you uh, experience. And then in the second part, we told them, you know, some of these images come from contemporary art museums, and these are works of fictional visual art or film, and some pictures were taken from documentary work depicting real life events. So we're changing here a little bit the frame, uh, trying to think about images as being, you know, a product of a creative process or something that depicts real life. And that was an interesting experiment because it's the only case where we actually found that not arousal per se, but political orientation predicted people's judgments. And you can see that in this figure here. So the more conservative um, were the participants, the more likely they were to say that the images they saw, the images of human suffering that they saw, were actually the product of artistic creative process rather than taken from a documentary. Whereas more liberal, self-reported liberal participants were more likely to say that these images are taken from a documentary. So the human suffering depicted is not something that has been artistically created. So let me sum up. Um, what, we, what we have set out to, to study and understand is the power of images. And we think that we've shown the crucial role that our physiology plays in engaging us with reality and imagery. Asking this question, you know, is an image real may not, may much, may not make much sense. Um, but I think, because intuitively, you, you know, there's a lot of interesting philosophical work behind what an image actually is and what is its ontological status, if you like. But given the fact that we live in a society, in a culture, that it is camera mediated, I think this question of what do we decide to believe in the things that we see is quite important. And what we show is that feeling in seeing seems to be a strong signal that at least partly determines our beliefs in the realness of, uh, of the image that we see. There are interesting things that we want to follow up, such as the age differences, people's political orientation, people's ability to mentalize their emotions, because we have some evidence suggesting that people who don't have good enough 
abilities for emotional recognition or emotional awareness, they tend to believe um, to a greater extent that this image of human suffering are fake rather than real. And lastly, I think, you know, everyone who's doing work in this area of social affected neuroscience, um, empathy, politics, should understand the importance of the cultural and historical factors in shaping our physiological engagement with, with the social world and with the, with the materiality of this, of this world. Now, one could argue that what we're actually showing is some form of good old existentialism, that physiological engagement indexes realness, indexes reality. So the more my physiology is engaged during my experiences, the more likely it is to, to perceive this, to experience this as being, uh, as being real. And in a sense that resonates with the way we think about interoception, the kind of ongoing dialogue, dialogue taking place between our viscera and our brain in shaping not only our cognitive process, uh, but also our self-awareness and our engagement with the world. And there are many different um, uh, pieces of evidence in the literature about the importance of interoception for these cognitive processes. Now, lastly, I want to to link this work with other work that has been going on in the science of fake news, you know, what kind of uh, fake stories are being disseminated, what are their particular characteristics. You have seen probably this mega study of all the tweets that have ever been tweeted, where they looked at how real and fake stories actually travel in the Twitter sphere. And the authors identified two important factors. One was um, emotions in particular discussed and the other was novelty surprise prediction error so how um, surprising is the particular story that you receive in your twitter feed in relation to the past uh, history of your of the tweets you have received that seemed to be an important factor in determining whether you're going to retweet uh, fake stories so these factors the emotional engagement and novelty or prediction or surprise seem to be important determinants in you know navigating what is real and what is fake and by and large you know we tend to default to truth we know that from many different studies of human communication uh, but the question is for how long will we be defaulting to truth if we start assuming that a lot of what goes on around us may not be real or authentic or trustworthy and that is particularly the case for uh, for the journalism and photographs. This is an excellent book edited by Roland Blaker on visual global politics. And he makes the case about the increasing role that images play in shaping our understanding of the world. And that has to do a lot with, you know, the seductive belief that what we see in a photograph is an authentic representation of the world. And that, of course, would make us wonder about the power of images, especially in the current context when so much manipulation can actually happen, not only in real images that can be manipulated, but also generating images of people, for example, who never existed, or videos that were never actually recorded, like the deepfake videos. And this idea of you know, the political capacity of images has a long history in the history of ideas. It is still hardly debated whether photography of suffering, for example, makes audiences indifferent to human suffering or not. But I think we do need to think carefully about the image literacy that citizens of today must acquire in order to navigate themselves in this environment. The important role of emotion regulation, mentalization, when we look at these images of human uh, condition, of human suffering, and how we can make citizens more smart, not just having smart algorithms. And uh, of course, you know, how these decisions on what to show uh, are taken in editorial offices. So we do live in this climate where more than ever before in human history, we were asked to judge the realness, truthfulness, and trustworthiness of our social world. And we see that from mainstream news to social media posts, from edited, edited photos to the fake videos, from humans to boats, and from alternative to fake news. And we need to judge the veracity of agents and the information they convey. And I think that our physiological engagement with this material, our emotions, of course, together with you know, cognitive biases or cognitive reasoning that we may have are, are very important in, um, in determining and shaping our relation with, uh, with our culture. 
There are some more reading if you want to do in some more recent work we've been doing that you can find in Psych Archives as preprints. We have done uh, a study looking at how people perceive realness in, in, in gun faces. So these are generative adversarial networks of the generated face of people who never existed. And a series of studies looking at the political consequences of certain types of visual framing in the context of the refugee crisis. And lastly, this work on visual politics have slowly moved my interest towards visceral politics, you know, understanding the importance of visceral states for political behavior. And of course, people like, uh, like Bert and Gies at the, the Hot Politics Lab are doing amazing work on emotions and politics. And they've also started looking at physiological variables. And I think there is much more scope for much more interesting work that can at last reconcile you know, humanities, social science, and life science is thinking about, you know, the physiology of human beings as animals and their political nature in participating in, in politics. And that's work to be continued. And I want to thank all these people who have been working with me over the years, and thanks all of you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Manos, for this, this, this excellent presentation as really uh, there's so much to think about uh i think i need a few minutes to relax <laughs> uh, uh, also um uh, welcome to our uh, 25 uh, participants today uh, i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did um and uh, uh if you have a question then you can type it into uh the q a box uh, and i will read out uh the questions um while you're writing, maybe one uh, little important uh, note for those of you uh, on the job market. Uh, we are looking for a postdoc uh, at the Hot Politics Lab, and the deadline is actually today. So uh, um, uh, you still have a few hours to, uh, to submit your application if you're interested. If you have any questions about this, then you know, feel free to contact me. Uh, all right, there's uh, the first question from uh, Matthijs Rodijn. Uh, thanks Manos, very interesting research. My question is about the mechanisms underlying the relationship between arousal and individuals judgments about the images. To what extent do you think this can be explained by a process of cognitive dissonance reduction? Mm -hmm. Someone who's aroused by an image might well want to think that the image is real because she, he might think it's silly to feel aroused by a fake picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fair point. I think that's probably part of the explanation of the study where we use this implicit measure, where you know we ask people to tell us you know, how surprised they are about the fact checking, um, about the fact checking uh, labeling. Um, I, so I don't think that you know, for sure during the course of you know the experiment that we designed or during the course of your ecological day-to-day -day interaction with visual images, this kind of cognitive, of cognitive dissonance actually happens. And it's not compatible with the view that we want to put forward that at the first moment of contact with this visual material, you know, the physiological engagement that it is so fast is what probably provides the first impulse to you to feel that, you know, to think that this image is real. And, you know, of course, you know, counteracting this with some kind of fact-checking, saying, you know, this image is actually fake, it's not real, would result in this kind of cognitive dissonance. So I don't think that it is um, incompatible. It's a complementary uh, explanation. There's a question from Christian. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It was super interesting. Uh, can you elaborate a, bit, elaborate a bit more on the types of picture you used here? Were they all pictures that were kind of used in a way originally to evoke emotions? So my, 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 my idea is maybe that some people automatically, they get that these pictures are, are used to trigger some kind of emotional feeling and they immediately judge if it's fake or real. And then depending on that, they might report if they believe in it. And that then might trigger if they actually feel aroused or not. Or are they just random pictures with different kinds of situations and, and well content. i mean all, all of the pictures have negative arousal that's for sure you know we didn't show them any pictures of kittens or you know babies or or dogs so they, they all the images belong to the tradition of photography of suffering 
I think what you're suggesting is that people, even though they didn't know that we will ask them anything about the realness of fakeness, you know, spontaneously, they were having this at the back of, of their minds. Um, it's not something that I can rule out. It's something that I find quite unlikely for people, you know, to, that sign up to an experiment where we told them, you know, we're going to show you images and we want you to tell us how you feel. And this is a quite common experimental intervention in psychological studies. You know, think about, think about all the IAPS pictures that intuitively and spontaneously they will think, oh, maybe, you know, what they're going to ask me is whether the images are real or, or fake. So it, that's what you were suggesting, right? Not really, not really asking themselves in the sense that they expect this from you later, mm -hmm. but more in the sense of that if that they see an, an image that that has a that has a negative um, a valence associated to it, that they immediately think about if it's staged up. Because I, I think about this Iraq picture that you showed, or the, the picture of um, um, that refugee boy on the Turkish shore, mm -hmm. where. Well, I could imagine that people who are seeing that see down that they know the context of it, they automatically think about it if it's if it's fake or real. And what you're saying is that first they take the first they make the decision whether it's real or fake, and then that yeah. upregulates yeah, or downregulates yeah, exactly. or whatever. If they don't believe it's real, then it's quite unlikely that they feel aroused by it, right? If they feel that it's fake, it's very unlikely yeah. that they will feel yeah. You know, I mean, this, uh, the, this is why we structured the experiment the way we did, to try and eliminate, you know, that possibility of having people, of letting people have at the back of their minds that this is gonna, what we're going to ask them. Uh, so the only other relevant thing that I would have to say is that, you know, and that's from a different context, but again, we had this kind of realness judgment, if you like, where in the gun face, so we did the studies where we look at how people perceive gun faces, whether they're able to actually distinguish between real face and gun faces. And that was again, a two part experiment. And there was an interval of a few months between the first part and the second part. And the first part of the experiment, we asked people whether they think that a gun face is real or fake. And then two months later, we asked them to make a judgment. And we saw that, you know, the kind of judgment they had given the first part of the experiment had the residual effect in the kind of behavior they had in the second part of the experiment. Now, the, what, the reason why I'm saying that is because that, I think you're right that when people commit to something as being real or fake, is a rather strong signal, and it's not easy to actually erase. But I do think that in the structure of the experiment that I presented now, and the evidence, you know, from both subjective reports, physiological engagement, which is much faster than, you know, heart acceleration, heart acceleration which is much faster than cognitive beliefs and at the level of the HEPs, we do find this consistent relationship between the arousal and, uh, and the judgments. I think what we could do, and that would be an interesting experiment that we haven't done, is to ask them first to make a judgment about the realness or fakeness of the experiment, of the images, and then in the second part, ask them to read the arousal, but also to look at physiological differences. And my prediction would be that in that second scenario, in that experiment, you may still find that, you know, at the subjective level, they may be reporting more arousal for the images that have judged as real, but maybe the physiological engagement, peripheral or central, will show a different signature. But it's, yeah, it remains to be seen. Okay, um, next question is from uh, Anonymous attendee. Hi Manos, uh, thank you for the great, interesting talk. I'm curious about your stimuli selection. How many of the negative pictures were about non-Western situations overall? Mm -hmm. You could see one's preconception that the situation is dire in still developing country, could colorize their realness rating, such that these people are in a developing country, people suffer there. These mm -hmm. subjects are suffering, so this picture should be real. Yeah, so we haven't looked at that in a, in a formal way. You know, it's so difficult to actually work with, with, this, with this kind of image sets. And we had it in all the studies we did as part of the BIAS project. You know, typically in psychology, we use IAPS pictures because we think that, you know, these are, you know, rated by thousands of participants. We have, you know, 
good consistent ratings and so on but we wanted specifically to start and working with visual material that's a bit more difficult to to work with so like these images or the images we use in the refugee studies that were all taken by again photo agencies most of the images we used have been published in in the media in different media outlets and so on and it's so difficult to actually do this kind of analysis and then you start thinking okay different images have different kinds of visual framings different images show different numbers of people different images use different lenses you know you may have a wide lens or you may have a close-up and these are all important factors that i'm sure play a role in the way they frame events in the way they frame our understanding of what goes on you know in my hometown if there's a riot or in places far away from me so it's just the beginning of of the work and you know my hope would be that other people for example from media studies and from psychological sciences would be willing to work with these kind of images and refine our understanding of how different factors in something which is very rich by its very nature this kind of photojournalistic images may have specific influences on people's attitudes and behaviors so i don't have an answer as to how you know the extent to which specific images that may refer to different cultures may list the greatest realness judgments. Okay, thanks. Um, Kimberly Tower has a question. Um, she writes, uh, great presentation and fascinating research. I agree that images are becoming more and more central to the way we define our political reality. But I wanted to ask, how do you think the prevalence of fake images will impact how we react to them. For example, if so social media becomes more and more saturated with fake images, people might, people might start tuning, tuning them out. Hmm. It's a fascinating question and I don't have the answer. I think, uh, well, I have some ideas and maybe some data that may be relevant. So whether people tune out, I doubt. I mean, if you look at the, the study on the Twitter stories that have been, you know, retweeted the fake and the real stories, you know, they found that fake stories travel faster and further. But it, this study doesn't answer a key question. Why do people retweet fake stories? Is it because they think that they're fake and they want to signal something? Is it because they believe that they're real? And we don't have any evidence about their intentions to why they do that. I think that people will continue to be engaged with this social media and the images that come to dominate social media. And that's the direction of travel. My worry is that we are entering a phase where the default will not be to trust and believe in the communication that is being disseminated, but rather the default will be to doubt and question. Now, one could think that this is a good thing, uh, but the problem is what happens if you tend to believe and trust the wrong sources, the fake one, rather than the real one. And this is what we're, what we're finding with the latest study we did on the gun faces, which makes me um, a bit ambivalent, because people tend to be a bit more cautious when you inform them about the presence of these artificial agents. But we also found that they're more likely to trust artificial agents than real agents. So it's a very, it's a very difficult uh, info system that we're building. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, sorry. Okay. I, uh, uh, sorry, uh, next question. <laughs> Isabella Rivasso, uh, thanks a lot for your talk, Manos. I have two questions. First, could it be that older people simply remember these historical events and therefore have stronger vis visceral reactions and know that these images are real? Second, how do you see the role of emotion regulation here? Yep. Is it possible that when we see a particularly violent Im image, we tell ourselves that it is fake to deal with the strong ne negative arousal. Mm, yes, good question. So for the first one, uh, it may be the case that all the participants actually, you know, may have seen this or may have known the events, for example, in, in Bosnia uh, and remember them for that. Um, we do find, we've also done a series of studies where we used real images and drill images in other words, images that were actually staged because 
that was also an interesting question uh, for us. And these are images of exercises from security services across the world that, for example, the stage a terrorist attack or the stage a natural disaster and photojournalists go there and they take pictures. And this is a very good control for the kind of image we've been using. And in these kind of scenarios, again, we find the same kind of relation between arousal and the probability judgment of judging an image as real. And uh, we do retain this kind of relationship between well, we do find again this relation that you know, for all the participants, the correlation, the the coefficient, uh, the coefficients are stronger between arousal and probability judgments. For your second question about the emotional regulation, um, what is its role? I think it, for me it was very interesting the finding that, and we had a, a rather crude measure of of people's emotional regulation. You know, alexithymia is a personality trait that indicates some kind of difficulty in verbalizing or recognizing emotions. And what we found for these people is that they were more likely to say that the images were fake. Now, I don't necessarily want this discussion of these findings to be normative in a way. So I'm not suggesting that people should actually feel that this image is real or they should engage with, with the human suffering in that way. We just want to highlight, you know, what are the possibilities of effectively and cognitively engaging with these kind of powerful images and think about what they could be doing. Just to give an example, you know, there's a lot of um, discussion in theory of photography that looking at this photography of human suffering makes people indifferent. I don't think that this is necessarily the case and we don't find this in our uh, data. And given the kind of political capacity that images have, I think we should allow for this photography of suffering to touch people and to actually you know, move them in a way. Now, where I think that emotional regulation will become important, your ability to regulate your emotion, in other words, your ability to recognize what this image is doing to you and how you can use this affect, will become more evident when we look not just at these judgments that people make, but on how, but looking at how images can actually change people's behavior. And this is not something that we have done with this set of studies uh, that I showed today. We have some evidence for that uh, in the studies we've done with, with refugees, where we show again, you know, what's the importance of people's emotions when they look at these images and how they can influence the political leader choices or support for different uh, policies. Okay, thanks, uh, Manos. Uh, there's a question in the chat box uh, by uh, Martijn Schoonvelde. Uh, but uh, yeah, Martijn just became father of two uh, uh, of twins. So I think the last time he slept, it was August. So we have to excuse him. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, he writes, uh, great talk, really interesting. I was wondering if judgments about the veracity of images is such a snap judgment that is driven by arousal. How would you think that we can improve people's image literacy? Mm. I think <laughs> it's interesting because uh, that's one, one thing that I would like to understand, you know, what is the, the, kind, the kind of views that non-academic people have about images? How do we, how do we see them? And I think my, because I'm fascinated by images in general and I love photojournalism, I think we constantly oscillate between two positions when we relate to images. And my, my feeling is that, you know, you, you see a powerful image, like an iconic image, like, you know, Alan Kurdi, the, the three-year-old who was, who was found dead in the Turkish shore. And it is so powerful that, you know, there's no gap between you and the image. It is, it is as if it's happening and it's so visceral and real. And at the same time, you can take a step back and cognitively reflect on what this image is, why it was shot like that. You know, what was the photographer's point of view when he or she was taking that picture? And then you can think about where does the image appear? Uh, you know, it does appear in the newspaper that you're reading or in, the, or in your Twitter feed that it may be mixed with many other, you know, indifferent, happy, ridiculous tweets, you know, about cats or whatever. So I think image literacy is important because 
first of all, it will make you accept the emotion that the image is actually conveying and enable you to feel it, but also try to put it in the right kind of context. And I think, you know, eventually image literacy will be something that will go into school curricula because a lot of what we're actually doing nowadays, you know, I can see myself, you know, how many images they are consuming in many different formats is incredible. And, you know, the capacity of the technology to generate all these new images is exponentially increasing. So I think, you know, these ideas of how, what images are and how they operate are central and they will become more central for, you know, managing our democratic political systems. Okay. Thanks. Um, next question, uh, Tobias Sp Spampati. Hi, Manos. Such a rich talk. I was wondering if the fact that the mainly negative arousal could have influenced realness ratings. From an evolutionary perspective, it is adaptive for you to pay attention to and believe real situations that elicit negative feelings as they might signal threats. Mm -hmm. Do you think this physiological arousal realness relationship would be as strong for a stimuli selection with only positive Im images or might it be limited to only negative valence? Mm. I think it would be the case for positive images, but as you know, in psychology, we're pretty bad at studying positive uh, emotions. You know, we're very good at studying negative emotions. And it, also, you know, you can think about iconic images that are positive, but may have, you know, have had power they're not as many as the negative ones um so my my feeling would be you know yes some positive images would also have would also list the same kind of of correspondence on the other hand you know what we also start finding with some of our studies like the one where we look at the emotional signature is that you know different types of emotions may have different consequences in the judgments that people make and when you what you say about threat while it sounds as it makes sense, what we found, for example, when we analyzed the emotional signatures of the images was that images that may elicit, you know, anger or disgust were not as strong indexes of realness as the image that elicited compassion and other more, I wouldn't say positive um, emotions, but of a different kind of, uh, of response to the one that you would expect that's associated with threat, like anger and fear. Okay. Uh, next question, Micah Homan. Thanks for your really interesting talk. You also asked in one of the experiments which emotions people felt in response to seeing the images. You found, if I understood correctly, only a relationship between certain emotions, categories, with the judgment of the realness of the images, but mm -hmm. not with others. Could you elaborate this a bit more? Do you think this relation is specific for certain emotions? For example, mostly for negative emotions with high arousal. Hmm. I think it relates to what I just uh, answered to Tobia, that we did find these relations for specific emotions to be more, uh, to, be, to be stronger indicators of realness. And these were, you know, mainly emotions associated with human suffering rather than with, with human violence. Um, what is the functional explanation of that? And whether you know it goes along the lines of what Tobia was saying about potential threats, it's something that I don't, I don't have the answer yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bert, do you have a question still? Mute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Manos. Uh, super interesting. Um, so, so one question is about you know, when when Gijs and I talk about emotions, uh, journalists like to talk about you know what can politicians do with this. But but would the would the takeaway point here uh, for for programmers of of fake images be make them as a make them as arousing as possible? And if so, do you have any idea of what makes makes can, is there some, I, I understand there's within subject variation, but are there some category, categories that make certain images more arousing than others? Uh, in other words, where should you be paying attention to? And that might also help in order actually to create the, the answer to literacy. What should we make people focus on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, it is a, 
so what, I mean, the question of, you know, what do you show is not something for the politicians to decide. Typically, you know, this is the decision of editorial offices. And as far as I know, you know, the kind of decisions they make at the editorial offices when they're receiving hundreds of images per day, especially during the crisis. You know, they have some serious debates about what kind of image should they show. So, for example, you know, there were debates in most editorial offices about the Alan Kurdi uh, image, whether, you know, they should show it or so on. As you know, in the U.S., there is this sort of unspoken rule that you're not showing dead Americans, right? And there's no, there's no real protocol. I mean, editors tend to rely on their gut feelings based on the past experiences to, to see what they're going to show and why. And there are some kind of norms in editorial of Slack. You know, you're not supposed to show dead Americans. You can only show dead foreigners. Um, and it's not to me, it, it's not up to me to decide and, you know, or to, to give recommendations to what they should be doing. I think, you know, it is what it is. What I'm, what I'm asking is, you know, think a little bit more about the different levels at which we engage with images. Uh, you know, the physiological and then the cognitive and be a bit more aware of what is the current, the current environment that we're operating. You know, the possibilities of all these fake or decontextualized images circulating uh, the web. So that would be my, my idea of, you know, how this work can actually start a discussion, which, you know, by the way, I'm sure that other people who work in media studies are having the same kind of, of discussions. Um, and about the arousal issue, there, there seems to be some kind of understanding in the, in the real office that they shouldn't go too much with the arousal because that will turn the audiences against them. Again, you know, as with most things in journalism, this is just a rule that remains to be violated. And one of the dangers is that we are moving into, uh, into an era where the imagery becomes more and more violent and more and more arousing. And things that we find acceptable to watch, to see today in, in the news, they were not acceptable maybe 20 years ago, but maybe they were acceptable 40 or 60 years ago. So again, you know, there is an interesting historical uh, story to be told behind what we decide to show and how. Oh, thanks. That's uh, that's uh, it's maybe also a nice way uh, to round up a little bit. Uh, we don't uh, end this meeting without uh, thanking you, uh, Manos, for this Thank you so much for really, me. really, really interesting talk. Uh, uh, I'm uh, I go into the week with a lot of uh, food for thought. Uh, definitely look at my newspaper differently uh, tomorrow morning. Um, I, um, I want to thank you, uh, speakers of our lab, get a, a hot politics mug, but uh, for that we'll, uh, we'll either have to be able to go back to our offices and then once we are back to our offices we'll send you one, but we'll also hope that you will be able uh, to visit us in real life at some point in Amsterdam because I think there's a lot more to talk about. I hope so too. Um, uh, I want to, uh, so after thinking, Manos, uh, just announce a couple of the upcoming speakers. Uh, next week, Friday, October 16th, we have Robert Clemenson from the University of Southern Denmark. He will talk about uh, his work on uh, elites' personality and whether or not elites are different, uh, politicians in terms of elites are different from citizens. Uh, the week after, both Gijs and I are on holiday, so you can take a break too. Uh, and the week after, we have Isabella Rabasso, uh, one of the PhD students in our lab, talking about the uh, experiments uh, she has done on uh, trying to figure out what is causing anger and anxiety, and a research master student, uh, Neil Farshing, who will talk about uh, some pre-registered replications of work, whether or not childhood personality is correlated with ideology in later life, using some cohort studies. In uh, November, we have a couple of really interesting speakers. We have Jen Jarrett, who just moved to Dartmouth to talk about uh, misinformation on November 6th. Ashley Jardina from Duke University to talk about white identity politics. Uh, and uh, you know, this is after the US election. So we'll see how white identity politics played out. And then uh, on November 20th, we have Ursula Hess, 
uh, to talk about facial mimicry. So a very exciting set of speakers from a, a wide variety of topics. So I hope you will be tuning in or listen to us on Spotify or YouTube or uh, in other ways that you can uh, figure out on the web. Uh, so I want to thank you. Have a nice weekend and uh, see you soon. Thank you very much. Yeah, this was great, Manas. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.